Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. Automated captions are available for this webinar and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and clicking on show subtitles. Then you can drag them wherever you want on the screen. Please note that the system we use is set to English and we're aware that this is a limitation and apologize for any errors that it might introduce to the captions during the webinar. I also want to apologize in advance for any Hawaiian words that I mispronounce. Please know that I respect the Hawaiian language and culture and I'm working on learning and improving. So thank you for your patience and understanding. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, which was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rare species from going extinct. Bird conservation works. Species and groups of birds have rebounded in the past decades, but it doesn't happen without people like you who care about birds. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. Today's webinar topic falls into the red colored top level of this pyramid, given the severity of endangerment and threats that Hawaiian birds are currently facing. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. Dr. Sam Ohugan is a senior scientist and cultural advisor at the Nature Conservancy of Kauai. He was born and raised in Niuanu and for over 40 years has worked in conservation in Hawaii, advocating for integration of Hawaiian cultural values and knowledge in conservation efforts. Sam has a bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a master's and PhD in animal behavior from the University of California, Davis. Patrick Hart runs the Listening Observatory for Hawaiian Ecosystems Lab at the University of Hawaii, Hilo. He has broad interest in the ecology and conservation of Hawaiian forests and forest birds. After receiving a PhD in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology from the University of Hawaii, Manua, he joined the faculty in the Department of Biology there in 2005. Lisa Kapono Mason is from Hilo and currently resides there with her Ohana, or Hohana. She spent several years as a high school science teacher and environmental programs leader on the Big Island before returning to the University of Hawaii Hilo to study conservation biology and avian ecology. Lisa has spent the last few years learning about the cultural evolution of native Hawaiian forest birds. Currently, she is studying the vocal characteristics of the endangered palila Amanua Kia. Luca Zavis is ABC's Outreach Associate for Birds Not Mosquitoes. She graduated from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, with her Bachelor's of Science and MEM from the Department of Natural Resource and Environmental Management. A local of Hawaii, Luca has worked as a conservation land specialist in Ina, Land That Feeds Us, educator, finding her passion in helping communities connect and in turn create their own stories with the place that they call home. Sam will start us off now. Aloha mai kako. I'm Sam Ohugan, Senior Scientist and Cultural Advisor for the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii, here to share a bit of the vast role our native Hawaiian birds play in Hawaiian culture. To ascertain that a certain plant or animal might have Hawaiian cultural significance, you can ask, is that plant or animal mentioned in the kumulipo? The kumulipo is a classic piece of Hawaiian oral tradition starting with the creation of the universe and the origins of life in the sea and building through the generation of life of sea, land, and sky, culminating with the birth of the Hawaiian gods and the creation of human beings and our familial relationship with everything that came before us. The chant is thousands of lines long out of necessity to tell the grand evolutionary epic, and birds appear very early in the Kumulipo, in the third wa, or epoch. The major gods, by comparison, do not appear until Wa Evalu, the eighth epoch. Thus, birds are the elders of even the gods, and in Polynesian cultures, as well as many other ancient cultures, the elders are revered, respected, and cared for. Let's look at one of the bird lines out of the Kumulipo. Hanau kamamo kamakua pukakana keiki he o o lele. Born is the mamo, the parent. Its offspring and o o hatches and flies. Thus we get two of the forest birds that provided the sought-after royal feathers, and it is natural that they would be paired, being intimately linked by their brilliant plumage. By the time of the third wa, the kumulipo, the seabirds, birds of prey, and forest birds populate the skies of Hawaii. 
Let's look at aspects of culture where birds are prominent and explore these connections via three major themes. First, an exploration of how from ancient times the deities of the Hawaiian pantheon were associated with specific birds. Secondly, some of the material expressions of Hawaiian culture derived from birds. And finally, the way that native birds, along with many other life forms, form the foundation of Hawaiian traditional knowledge. Each of these topics could take days, so we'll have to skim the surface to give you just a taste of the rich universe of cultural context in the Hawaiian natural world. Hawaiian tradition holds that ancestral spirits can take the form of many different native plants and animals. And these many forms, called ki no lau, are physical manifestations of a deity and thus are held sacred. Let's explore one of the sacred bird ki no lau of one of the major Hawaiian gods, called Akua. Ku is the god of war, governance, and leadership. And it is a relationship between Ku as god of forest trees, forest birds, and featherwork that link the ruling chiefs to the god of leadership. The brilliant colors of forest birds directly link the chiefly ali'i class with the upland realm of the gods, the wawakua. The sheer beauty and superb workmanship inherent in Hawaiian featherwork is unexcelled anywhere in the world. Hawaiian featherwork is probably the most obvious expression of the importance of Hawaiian forest birds to Hawaiian culture. Those feathers are largely from three genera of forest birds. The O'o genus Moho and the Mamo genus Drapanis provided brilliant yellow and contrasting black. The Iivi, also genus Drapanis, provided the scarlet, while the O'u genus Siderostra provided green. It is a sad statement that all but one of these species is extinct today. Iivi are still to be found on several islands, but all populations are declining. The O'u was last seen and heard in 1988. I was among the last to see and hear this bird during the Audubon Christmas bird count of that year. O'o and Mamo have also not been seen in this century. The last Mamo was seen in 1898 and was likely extinct by the early 1900s. The last O'o was heard in 1987 on Kauai. But it was not over exploitation of forest birds for feathers that led to their extinction. Early naturalists reported species now extinct as common throughout much of the 1800s, but also noted disease epidemics among a wide range of forest bird species in the late 1800s, accompanied by precipitous declines in abundance. In addition, by the time avian malaria was introduced in the early 20th century, much of the lowland forest that provided for seasonal foraging areas was completely lost and between loss of critical habitat and spread of both pox and malaria by mosquitoes, the 1800s and 1900s were marked by extinction of well over half of our forest bird fauna. This was after traditional feather gathering had largely disappeared as a practice. The other reason that traditional exploitation was not likely the cause of extinction was the restricted sacred nature of the practice. In mo'olelo, or traditional stories, birds were sometimes depicted as the caretakers of goddesses. In the story of La'ie Kawai, for instance, she was cared for by bird attendants that carried her about, and she lived in a house thatched with brilliant feathers. But in the story of Hi'iakai Kapolio Pele, the forest birds were spies for the mo'o deity of Pana'eva, who was the arch enemy of the Pele clan. So just as each of the Akua and Aumaku of Hawaii have their personal attributes, Hawaiian forest birds could likewise be viewed as beneficial or harmful, depending on the circumstances. Some of our most beautiful Hawaiian songs use birds to describe the loved one. In the mele that Queen Kapi Olani wrote for King Kalakaua, Hipo Le Manu, Beloved Wreathed in Birds, Kapi Olani thinks on her beloved husband who had embarked on a voyage to San Francisco. In one of the verses, she selects the iivi as a specific bird metaphor. Iivi a ouka, po le naikaua, an iivi of the uplands, moistened by the rain. To liken the king to an iivi with its royal feathers incorporated into the finest featherwork is easily understood. And to those who enjoy Hawaiian poetry, cold and wet, especially in the uplands and in native forests, is the metaphor of intense love. So I hope our brief tour 
leaves you knowing a bit more about the great cultural significance of Hawaiian birds. I hope you can take pride in the symbol of abundance that was inherent in the amazing featherwork that was manifest in traditional times. View the sacred nature of our birds as embodiments of the gods of the Wawakua. Appreciate the roles that birds played in our storied places and epic tales and songs, and recognize our birds as cultural treasures, as well as amazing expressions of island evolution. And with that, mahalo, thank you for your kind attention. Well, aloha, everybody, and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Patrick Hart. I'm a professor of biology here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And I just wanted to present to you today some of the work we do in our lab. I'm the, also the PI of the Listening Observatory for Hawaiian Ecosystems. It's a bioacoustics lab here at UH Hilo. And so I just want to talk about the goals of our lab and what we're doing, um, along with a lot of other folks here, including ABC, to help um, preserve what we have less left of, of our Hawaiian bird species. So the goals of our lab, really, we're a bioacoustics lab. And so we provide infrastructure, support, and training to graduate students, undergraduates, and postdocs for doing bioacoustic research in Hawaii. And a major goal of ours lately is to develop and implement new ways um, for monitoring the distribution and abundance of our rare Hawaiian birds. So this is uh, some of the grad students and undergrads in our lab all working on various bioacoustics projects related um, to some aspect of bird conservation in Hawaii. And so one thing we've been studying is, you know, song in birds is a culturally transmitted trait. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important behavior that all birds do, and it's very important to mating success, to territoriality, to group cohesion, predator avoidance. And typically song is learned um, from between individuals. It's a culturally transmitted trait. And so, and so the question is, what happens to these culturally transmitted traits that are really important when populations become reduced, such as what's happened to many of our birds? And so is there a, a lack of ability for them to transmit their culture when they have very few individuals to learn these important characteristics from? So that's one area of research in our lab we've been working on lately. Um, we've been, a big focus of ours recently is using bird song to monitor the distribution and abundance of birds in our forests. And traditional ways of monitoring birds require highly trained observers to go out in the forest. Oftentimes it's very difficult to access places and more or less you listen for the presence of birds and when you when you hear when you hear a particular bird you write the distance of the bird down and what species it is and then you use that information to put it into models to determine how many birds we have in a particular area and so it's a very labor intensive process but basically it uses sound you often can't see the birds in the forest we just know that they're there by the songs that they make and so we're using song not, we're using recorded song by using these automatic recorders put out in the forest to give us a better and more detailed understanding of where these rare and endangered birds are and what are their population trends over time in a lot of these difficult act to access forests. So we're really excited about developing this new method for estimating the density of animals um, using a, sing a single acoustic recorder. So many of you have probably heard about song meters, which are basically, you can program them to record all throughout the day. And you can place many of them, you can place many of them in arrays through the forest and they can record continuously on whatever program you want. You go back and pick them up maybe a, a month or two months later, depending on the battery life. And so we, we've been working 
with others to develop new ways to monitor birds using these automated recorders to give us better information about where these rare and endangered birds are so that we can actually um, go out and and um, implement conservation actions to protect them. And most recently, <clears throat> we've been a co-sponsor along with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, and Kaggle, which is an arm of Google, to sponsor this coding competition. So, you know, many of you have used on your smartphones the Merlin app or perhaps the BirdNet app. And what it is, it's a it's a machine learning algorithms that can automatically detect the species of whatever bird is singing, right? Well, that has not been applied to research questions or monitoring questions for birds yet. Um, and there's a huge need for that in Hawaii, right? But we don't, the, the, the applications haven't been trained on Hawaiian bird species. And so we've been working with the Cornell Lab to train the bird net algorithm so we can better detect the presence of many of our rare and endangered species in the forest using these automated song meters. And so that's a big area of research right now. We're really excited to be in implementing this by the end of this summer where we should be able to put out song meters across um, uh, areas of forest where we have a lot of rare birds, leave them out for months, pick up, um, take the sound cards out and then run it through the computer and it'll tell us the location and even how many individuals potentially of each of these uh, species that we're interested in. And then we can use that information to, um, for, to implement conservation actions like I was mentioning, such as the Wolbachia mosquito method that you'll be hearing about in a little bit. And finally, our, our lab, another focus of our lab is to provide, to establish an early warning system for the influx of mosquitoes into Hakalau Forest, National Wildlife Refuge. Now, Hakalau Forest is considered the last best place, really, for intact native Hawaiian forest bird community left in the state. And it's on the east side of Mauna Loa Volcano, really just above Hilo, where I am right now. And it's a big area of forest, about 15,000 acres of old growth, wet forest, very few trails and roads through there. And the biggest, um, most of the, the forest bird communities remaining at Hakalau, we have eight species of, of forest bird, native forest birds there. Most of the birds are in the higher elevation tracks of forest. And this is high elevation up here. This is the ocean on the right, top of Mauna Kea on the left. And this is forest line right here. And most of the birds are in this upper elevation forest. And the big problem with climate change right now is that the biggest threat to our birds is the influx of disease carrying mosquitoes. So our birds are not resistant to avian malaria and which is transmitted by these Culex mosquitoes. The mosquitoes primarily live in the low elevations, but they make it up into, they're, they're predicted to increase in elevation. They've been shown to be doing this on other islands with global warming, right? And so as, as the islands warm, the mosquitoes are gonna increase in elevation into the remaining uh, uh, prime forest bird habitat to the detriment of our birds. And so we're trying to have an idea of if and when this is happening so we can implement mosquito control um, techniques, right? So we've established these two long transects into the forest that never has seen transects or humans in, in decades really. And we've put out mosquito traps and also these bird, uh, bird song meters so we can monitor the presence and abundance of birds over time. And also um, the goal is to monitor mosquitoes so we can let the refuge know if there's an, there's an influx of of mosquitoes into the refuge. So those are those are some major areas of our um, very busy lab right now. Um, another um, very exciting development in my mind is that many of us have been involved with this new group, Ahui Manu. And so Lisa Mason, who is a graduate student in our lab, is going to tell you about some of the um, work that uh, many of our lab members have been um, involved with with this new Ahui Manu group, which is, um, which is recently established to provide new connections between birds and, and the people of Hawaii. So Lisa. 
Mahalo, Pat, and aloha, everyone. Uh, like Pat said, my name is Lisa. I'm a master's student at UH Hilo, and I'm also a member of the Lohe Lab. And I want to continue with this idea of the power of crowdsourcing solutions, as mentioned by Pat with the bird cleft competition, but from a broader community perspective for our Hawaii birds, and to share some exciting activities with Lonoa Honua here in Hawaii that are helping to reawaken and to grow our relationships with our island's wildlife and our communities uh, through the power of storytelling and ritual practice from a Kanaka Maoli or a native Hawaiian lens. So Lanoa Honua is a multi-program organization under the direction and creatorship of master educator and kumuhula and Kekuhi Keli Kanaka Ole on Hawaii Island and uh, we really focus on the development and perpetuation of Hawaiian life ways and stewardship training. Um, one of its newer teams, which I'm a part of, is called Ahui Manu. And this is a collaboration between many uh, local bird enthusiasts and scientists, Hawaiian scholars, conservation professionals, hula halau, and, and so many others, to uplift and to create these pulses of vitality for our native birds um, through cultural practice, um, that are relevant and grounded in our modern lives. And part of this work definitely centers around education, but, but it also builds on Hawaiian perspectives of how we relate to our birds as family members, as a part of our ohana, um, and connecting us to the places that these ohana live and learning how to engage with them as some of our most ancient relatives. And we believe that uh, we have to honor these ancestral and cultural lineages of Hawaii birds um, and what they embody for all of us. And when we shift our focus towards collectively talking about Hawaii's birds, asking questions about them, singing to them, and normalizing ceremonies and rituals around them, creating stories about them, all those things, uh, these relationships become more powerful and active towards the causes that we're talking about today. And as we would say, uh, it relashes our ties and it helps to unify our community. And this is what we really need more of to prevent extinction you know, of, of our most endangered birds. And for us to really get on the same page, we need unification and a shared vision. Uh, you know, the, the naturalist Sir David Attenborough, um, I love his perspective. And he says that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. And so at Ahui Manu, we are elevating the personal stories and experiences throughout our communities. And we're reinforcing these connections, um, hopefully to help to support causes and um, healthy behaviors and important legislation and policies that will ultimately help to protect our native birds. Um, Pat, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so I am so grateful and inspired by the work of Ahui Manu. Um, there are many cool projects that are happening at the moment. Um, these are some of our current endeavors. Uh, for the last few months, the team has been composing a contemporary version of a section or va of one of the most sacred pieces of Hawaiian text that we have today, the uh, cosmogony and genealogical chant that is called the Kumulipo. And in this adaptation, Okulele Ane Auna, the general framework of the Kumulipo is used to call out the birthing of subsequent life forms and specific creatures that are associated with each of the birds in each stanza um, from the plant world and from the ocean world. And this concept of relationships between the heavens and the land and the ocean is very central in Hawaiian ways of thinking. So here on the screen and the two pauku or, or the stanzas that are showed here to the right, we read about the birth of the seabirds, Hanau Manu Ke Kai. And the firstborn is the Iva or the great frigid bird who is guarded by the He'e or the octopus in the ocean and secured by the Iva Iva or the maiden hair ferns in the uplands. And through this mele or composition, we can dig even deeper uh, to uncover the layers of biological and ecological and behavioral relationships that these creatures share. So currently, Okalele Ane Ona has 21 birds represented in this piece, and it is a ki oli or a chant 
in our ceremonial repertoire that we use during our AHA or gatherings, which take place every 10 days and um, it alternates between sunrise and sunset. We are also in the process of curating a diverse collection of stories from across Hawaii, um, from people who have unique bird experiences, both native or non-native, and who were interested in recounting and documenting these stories. We, we really truly believe that these stories need to be preserved and passed on and remembered because they're an important piece of our culture that we don't want to make the mistake of losing. Uh, another thing that we're working on is we are reimagining soundscapes. Um, we're making new recordings and engineering new compositions. And we're playing with ideas of how to teach and reconnect people to the sounds of our forests, um, particularly the sounds of our, our native birds. And um, we are, one way of doing this, artistically uh, performing the sounds of the birds. Um, we are coming up with um, some what we're calling kanaka mimicry, or human mimicking of their calls and songs, um, using our voices as a means of connecting during our aha, our bird gatherings. So it's a lot of fun. We get together and we all make bird sounds. It's a little wild, <laughs> but um, you know that that really is a part of this meaning making. We're we're enjoying this process. Um, we also have some big things that are coming up. There are ideas for a new hula bird festival on Hawaii Island that we hope will eventually spread across all of Hawaii. And um, lastly, I, I want to end with an invitation and on the last slide. Um, if you are interested in joining this Aloha movement and learning more about our participatory AHA, uh, you can find us on the Lono Honua Facebook and Instagram pages, um, on social media. You can access the calendar and join our next event there. And our next AHA is online at 6.15 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time on August 4th. So mahalo and thank you for listening and being with us today. Aloha mai kaku. My name is Luca Nicole Savas. I work for the American Bird Conservancy as the Outreach Associate for Birds Not Mosquitoes. I'm here today to chat with you all about a conservation tool that the Birds Not Mosquitoes Partnership is pursuing to accomplish our goal of Iolo Namanu Nahele, so that the for forest birds may thrive. Specifically, the partnership is working to save the native honeycreepers of Hawaii. Around five to six million years ago, the ancestors of the honeycreepers arrived here, and from them arose over 55 different species. Unfortunately, only 17 species remain, most only found in remote mountain forests. Of the remaining honeycreepers, many are considered endangered or vulnerable. Today, I would like to highlight four honeycreepers that are right on the precipice of extinction. The Aki Kiki is estimated to disappear from Hawaii's forests as soon as next year, with maybe only 40 to 50 individuals left. For the other three um, species, such as the Akeke'e, Kiwiku, and Akohe Kohe, they are estimated to disappear in the next five to 10 years. These remaining honeycreepers face the same threats of other native species, but one overarching threat poses the greatest risk of extinction to these native birds, and that is mosquitoes and malaria. The southern house mosquito was introduced to Hawaii in 1826, and in the early 1900s, these mosquitoes became a vector for the parasite that causes avian malaria. The honeycreepers of Hawaii evolved absent of the presence of disease, thus their immune response was lost over time. Now, for most of our honeycreepers, one bite from an infected mosquito equals death. For a while, these honeycreepers found refugia in the Wau Akua, the high elevation native forest. These forests had previously limited mosquito abundance and disease transmission since the mosquitoes and malaria are cold and tolerant. But the effects of climate change are increasing temperatures and allowing mosquitoes and the disease to invade the birds remaining habitat. The forests only go so high on these islands and thus the birds are running out of space. Mosquito surveys on the islands of Kauai and Maui are finding the southern house mosquitoes at densities and elevations never seen before and now they are discovering them year around. So our honey creepers aren't having any time away from these mosquitoes. And so what can we do? And this is a question that a small group of federal and state agencies and non-governmental organizations, collectively known as Birds Not Mosquitoes, has been looking into. 
The Bears Not Mosquitoes concluded that the incompatible insect technique is the most promising tool we have to stop the extinctions of our native forest birds. So how does this work? Like most organisms, insects carry different bacteria inside of them that can influence their biology. Just like some people might eat Activia yogurt to get bacteria to help them digest their food, we can use bacteria as a tool to reduce mosquito populations. That's because in insects, including mosquitoes, there are bacteria that affect their reproduction. So a mosquito can have an incompatible strain of bacteria that makes reproduction with other mosquitoes impossible. The approach of using a mosquito with an incompatible strain of bacteria to control other mosquitoes can be referred to as birth control because the mosquitoes still mate and they lay eggs, but those eggs won't hatch. The image on the left, you see two mosquitoes with the same bacteria. They mate, lay eggs, and those eggs hatch, grow into larvae, to mosquitoes, and then the cycle repeats. The image on the right, the male mosquito has the incompatible strain of bacteria. Thus, when they mate, the female lays eggs, but they don't hatch. The bacteria that the incompatible insect technique uses is called Wolbachia. Wolbachia is a naturally occurring bacteria that is in, present in over half of all insect species worldwide and is already present in many native and non-native insects in Hawaii, including our target species, the southern house mosquito. To achieve mosquito suppression that will reduce the transmission of avian malaria, we will need to flood the system, meaning that we will need to release enough males, which do not bite, to increase the probability that the wild females will mate with an incompatible male over a wild type male. So what you see in front of you are um, mosquitoes in Hawaii. So the red mosquitoes are those that have the wild type Wolbachia that is already um, found within the Southern house mosquito here in Hawaii. The female is indicated by the white halo. The blue mosquitoes are those that carry the incompatible strain of Wolbachia. So we will flood the system so that when they meet, there's a probability that they will reproduce with the incompatible males and produce non-viable eggs that don't hatch, over time decreasing the number of mosquitoes in the environment. I would like to highlight that male mosquitoes do not bite. So by only releasing male mosquitoes, people will not have increased um, opportunities of being bit. We are also focusing our deployment to critical habitat of the Hawaiian honey peepers to erect a barrier protection, focusing on where the birds currently are found with a vision of recovery and abundance, that we can expand the habitat for the birds to one day be back to the historic peak to see abundance. Now I'd like to clarify that this is not a genetic modification. There is no modification of the mosquitoes or the Wolbachia. We are taking a naturally occurring phenomenon and adapting it to benefit and protect our native birds. And we are not the first to use this technique. Wolbachia-based mosquito birth control has been used at, in at least 10 countries around the world to reduce the transmission of human disease with no reported negative health or environmental impacts. The use of this tool in Hawaii will be the first application for a conservation purpose. And this adaptation for a conservation purpose takes a lot of effort from the um, partners within Birds Not Mosquitoes. We are working to um, conduct research to influence our deployment of these um, mosquitoes, um, how we are going to be bringing them from the continent to Hawaii and then out into our native forests, whether that is on the backpacks of humans, through helicopters or in drones. We are working to have meaningful community engagement as we work through the regulatory process and approval timeline. And underneath it all, finding funding for this is not a one-time application. This is would need to be happening over um, a period of time as if we stop releasing these incompatible male mosquitoes, the female mosquitoes from lower elevations can come back and rebring up the population to the size that it was and the abundance that it was before suppression was implemented. And so I would just like to go over our timeline a little bit. Um, here we are in 2022. We are working with partners to develop and test a mosquito line of incompatible Culexes, um, develop these release technologies such as drone, 
We are working on two environmental assessments on Kauai and Maui and starting to develop a statewide EA. Uh, moving forward into next year, we will continue working to obtain our permits and then begin small scale field tests. And then moving on in 2024 and 2025 to increase to landscape releases on Maui and Kauai with monitoring happening um, throughout. And what's really important as Sam and um, Pat and Lisa all um, insinuated was this connection between our birds and our community. And so in some cases, the conversation may be with one individual at a time and other ways um, through broader yet focused gatherings. We are and we will be connecting with those who use the forest, whether that is Hawaiian practitioners gathering plant materials, hunters looking to feed their families or botanists, bird watchers and recreational hikers. We're connecting with policy leaders and those whose mission intersect with our project. And yes, we are engaging with those who might oppose this strategy for whatever reason. Some of the challenges we face in community engagement include the reality that our birds are now so limited in their distribution that very few people know them. Our communities live down here in the lower elevations near the shore where our birds not, are not located. So our vision is that one day our forest birds would again be so numerous that their feathers could once again be woven into Lehulu and their songs be heard and treasured across the islands. If you have, that was a lot to learn in such a short period of time. If you have more questions or you want to learn more, please connect with us via our social accounts, websites, or you can email me at lzavis at abcbirds.org. Thank you.